So hello everyone and welcome to the MIT Vision Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have Vittorio Ferrari to talk about his recent work on 3D deep learning. Uh, Vittorio Ferrari is a senior staff research scientist at Google where he leads a group on visual learning. And he received his PhD at ETH Zurich in 2004 and he did a postdoc at INRIA and at the University of Oxford. He was an assistant professor between 2008 and 2012 at ETH Zurich and a faculty at the University of Edinburgh, where he became a full professor in 2016. And he's now an honorary professor. In 2012, he received uh, the ERC starting grant, and he has uh, authored more than 120 publications, including, including a best paper award in HCB uh, for his work on semantic segmentation propagation in, in ImageNet. Uh, besides his work on 3D deep learning, which he will talk today, uh, his research focuses on learning visual models with minimal human supervision, uh, semantic segmentation and human machine collaboration, in which he has proposed uh, very novel and exciting paradigms for incorporating like human feedback and models for annotation. And he has served as Aria Cherry in major computer vision conferences, as well as a program chair in ECCB 2018. And he will be a, he's a general chair for the upcoming ECCB 2020. Uh, welcome, Vito. We're excited to have you. Hello, Xavier. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I will be presenting uh, something relatively new for me. As you said, I mostly work on 2D problems before, annotation, segmentation, detection. And this is really our first freshly baked wave of papers in this area. I'll try to keep it to 40 minutes, so we have time for questions. And I will also meet several of your team members afterwards. So let's get going. Um, this area, as I define it, is trying to learn single image 3D reconstruction. The goal is to reconstruct the whole scene, not just one object. So reconstruct a 3D shape, like a mesh, for every object in the scene, detect the occlusion between objects in the image, and reconstruct, hallucinate, if you wish, the occluded part. Also try to establish support relations, like the bottle is on the table, and how this affects uh, the estimation of 3D shape. Ideally, we would like to go towards whole scene 3D understanding, also figuring out material properties, like wooden and reflect. Importantly, and I will talk about it in the talk, is I would like to reconstruct all the objects into a single common coordinate frame so that all of them live in one coordinate frame and not detached separate reconstructions. So one thing that we do heavily, and it will be in all of the three parts of my talk today, will be to train from as photorealistic as possible rendering of 3D assets that you can find on the internet. So this will provide samples of the basic association between a pixel patch and something about curvature in 3D. But also we provide examples of the three arrangements of objects in scenes and various properties like material style, uh, illumination effects that happen across objects and so forth. Um, this is of course an objective shared by many research groups. And what I think is, it's interesting is that once you start thinking about training from photorealistic rendering, you naturally feel the need for developing more and more advanced differential rendering engines that uh, can then be plugged in into end-to-end -end training pipelines. So when I say advanced, I mean not just forward projection with a little bit of shading, but having also global illumination effects like light interaction between objects and shadows. That would be in the third part of my talk. So along the way to this, which of course we didn't solve, um, I will be going to show you three of our recent works. And they are not connected in any particular way. They don't form a path towards the solution. These are explorations in this wider playground. In the first, I'm going to show you Cornet, which is our first attempt at actually taking a stab at really having multiple objects and reconstructing all the 3D shape currently in one coordinate frame. Then I'm going to go back to single object reconstruction with a new uh, basic machine learning model, which extends normalizing flows to enable conditioning on images instead of just purely being a, a priority distribution of the data. And I will close with this uh, an error rendering work where uh, I'm going to show you a way to in a way, simulate Blender, simulate a standard graphics pipeline with a neural network, which takes boxes and a few parameters and outputs you a photorealistic scene image. So off we go with the first work, which is not yet published. We come out at the CV um, in a couple of months. So a little bit of generic related work. There are been really a big surge in the last five years, I would say, maybe seven on really many works that do neural networks for single object reconstruction. Typically, they take a simple image, like here on the left. Can you guys see my mouse pointer? Yeah, thank you, Xavier. Very good. So here on the left, um, and they, they output 
um, a voxel mesh or point cloud reconstruction. Um, there is, these works typically focus on being clever about the volume representation. They do voxels or meshes or point clouds, cuboidal primitives, and many, many intermediate representations that have been presented. Implicit representation like occupancy networks that have now become popular. And typically, they do it on synthetic images which have quite low realism, like uniform background and only local illumination modes. But there has also been, has been a few works that have tried to do the multi object reconstruction uh, grand vision. Um, here I cite some of the, the popular ones, but there are more. And they all come with some shortcoming, as always, uh, mainly uh, in relation to our work, these reconstruct objects independently. They first detect them in the 2D image, like a good example, mesh of CNN, first segment or detect objects in the 2D image, and then reconstruct the, a mesh for every object independently without trying to take care of their coherence, for example, without enforcing space or exclusion constraints, that two points in space shouldn't be occupied by the same, by two different objects. Um, also, it, perhaps due to the lack of uh, multi-object 3D perfect annotated data sets, now that, um, uh, that SANCG has been banned, um, previous works typically do not evaluate fully multi-object reconstruction. There is also something that just came out now. I recommend if you didn't read this one yet, have a look, Total 3D Understanding, by, not, not at all by my team, where they managed to really do full scene uh, room layout uh, along with reconstruction of meshes for every object. That's when it's a really very nice concurrent work that's totally in our spirit. There is also a batch of other works that are a little less related, for example, estimating room layout as cuboidal primitives instead of uh, meshes, like in the good earlier days of this field. Um, or scene completion from depth maps or depth and normal estimation from a single RGB image. All these works are into one uh, generic uh, area, uh, but uh, the works on this slide don't attempt to really reconstruct full shape, but pieces of tree. So here is uh, Desirata that uh, we've, read, we've wrote down and, and, and inspired us to, to design our method. So the first is we want to reconstruct the shape class and pose, also object class of all the objects in one common coordinate frame, that's important enforcing spatial exclusion. So every point in 3D space should be occupied by at most one object and trying to resolve occlusions, especially hallucinating missing parts. We want a model that's translation equivariant, which means that it should react to different pixel patches in different locations of the image, even if these are placed at different positions than at training time. So if you have an object in the top left corner of the scene at training time and it moves to the bottom right, you should still be able to um, reconstruct it in a transition equivariant manner. So you also want a model that is able to do fine output resolution because when you have uh, multiple objects in the same scene, they typically appear a little smaller and they occupy a smaller amount of volume each. This leads us to, to the model. Um, I'm going to open various blocks. Uh, we input that an RGB image, we pass it into secret source neural network core that I'm going to present next. And this is going to predict object classes on a discrete grid in the output 3D space. Like a, imagine a multi-class prediction or like a multinomial at every point. And then from there, we're going to apply some advanced variants of matching cube to get meshes out. And if we now open a network core, we, we can come to our first contribution of this work. So we looked around at what would be a good volume representation. Um, the two most frequent ones are voxels, which are very nice, very easy, very digestible for neural networks, but they typically require a lot of memory if you want to go to fine grained resolutions. The memory they require is cubic in the side of the cube, in the number of voxels in the cube. But it's good, it's convolutional, so it's trans translation equivariant by design. So recently, people have proposed a beautiful implicit function models um, that are perhaps epitomized by occupancy networks, but there are many other papers like this. In principle, with those models, you can get arbitrary high resolution with a fixed memory footprint. Um, but you're not guaranteeing transition equivariance. So depending on how the model learns, uh, it might learn that actually uh, when an object moves from the left to the right, it actually changes its shape. You also need to repeat inference for every point. The way these models work is that you input the image and a query point, and they output whether the point is on an object or not, or an SDF or some other advanced representation. But you need to run inference many times, which makes them slow. So here we propose something hybrid that tries to join the advantages of voxels and also uh, implicit function models. So we pass our image into a decode, a 2D encoder, and then a series of 3D convolutional decoders, which we are going to expand on later. And the model predicts um, a value at every one of a grid points, just like a voxel model, but the 
exact emplacement of the grid in 3D volume can be changed with a single global offset that you can input to the model at inference time. So you can tell him, please shift my grid by a little bit, and the model will answer as if it were sampling the volume. Instead of thinking of it as voxels, as little cubes, think of it as a sampling grid that happens on 3D space. So now, if you train it properly, details in the paper, then you get something a bit halfway. It's a little bit like an implicit model with instead of one query, you have a grid of queries, and it's a little bit like a voxel grid, but the voxel grid is not fixed. So now you can play with these offsets and you can get a finer resolution at test time than the resolution at which you trained it in. And you still have a fixed memory footprint, which is native resolution of the model. And so you get your desirata number five in my slides. But it's also convolutional, so you get transition equivalence, uh, equivalence by design. Um, so now, if we do this, uh, we, we have some advantages, but you also have one disadvantage at test time. You cannot just do one inference pass because then you only get the lower resolution. Now, uh, at inference time, when a new image comes, you call the neural network core model one time for every grid offset you want. So in the end, if you want to get from, let's say, 32 cube to 64 cube, then you need to call it eight times, which sends you back to the same computational complexity as a higher resolution voxel model, but with eight times less, less memory. So now I'm going to dwell a little bit more into, into how we get the other properties. So if we zoom in, if we zoom in this bit, now it expands. Um, we can see the RGB input image comes in. One of these columns you can see here, you can imagine it's an image that is made by a single column so that it fits my slide. I didn't manage to make a 3D slide. Um, this gets passed through a 2D image encoder, which gets a little bottleneck features. And then you have a 3D decoder, which is a classical architecture, which then expands into this 2D image encoding into the 3D volume that you want to reconstruct. And at every point on the grid, you predict a per point class PDF, like in recognition networks. Um, so because you have this, this structure with a 3D decoder, the deconvolution that are in, in there can hallucinate missing parts. They also see context in the image. So if they see a piece occluded, they also see the occlusion boundary and pieces of the occluded object that helps them guess how the shape should have been. But because we have a single volume representation for the entire scene, we automatically get a common coordinate frame that we wanted. And we also get space exclusion, space exclusion constraints due to the fact that you predict a full PDF at every point. And the disadvantage of this is that, of course, you need high resolution for the full scene, and hence this hybrid representation I just showed you. So I'm going to show you one more element. Um, this was kind of the basic model. We also made it a little better by adding what we call ray trace skip connections. So let's assume for a moment we can get the camera parametric matrix. So you can get that, for example, the extrinsic parameters, you can get them by cheating, by just saying the world is at the middle of the image and reconstructing camera coordinate frame. You need to know the intrinsic stuff that relates a bit pixel size to distance and depth. And these are often available in modern, um, modern images since in the exit metadata. If you don't have it, okay, then you cannot use this piece of the model. So now once you have the intrinsic and the extrinsic, you have the camera matrix and you can project and back project from the 3D world to the pixels. And that's good because now we can add a new component, which we call ray trace skip connections that connect a pixel in the image to a frustum of voxels in the output or of points in the output. So now you can embed the light transport equation into the model by propagating from the 2D local information to the 3D world along the primary rays. So basically, it transports local uh, appearance information that is in the encoder to a full sum of points in the 3D decoder here. So this is good because the, visual, the visible object parts can still draw information directly from the image. And the hidden parts, they benefit because they can still use the decoder up sampling through the transpose convolutions. But now they land in the right point in 3D space. So this typically, I'm going to show you later, it leads to sharp reconstruction details. And in terms of connecting to our desirata for multiple object reconstruction, this also helps propagating the occlusion boundaries and the contact points between objects that you detect in an image into the 3D world. This helps you also disambiguate the local depth ordering between objects. So now the input becomes RGB image and the camera matrix that you need to know. You call the model multiple times so you get high resolution. You get your PDFs out and you can reconstruct your meshes. One last piece, I don't want to spend too much time on this one, is to change the training loss. In, this is a halfway between being a recognition and a reconstruction model. 
Um, because the output space is a class distribution per point, you would be tempted to do cross entropy. But in this type of problems, the output volume is incredibly sparse, more sparse than into the object detection. Most points are void. And this leads to a lot of class imbalance. You could do focal loss, and we did that to try to compensate for this. Um, in this one paper, we show that if you modify the standard 2D object detection training loss IOU uh, to work in this world of multi class 3D, then you also get a relief. So, here's all. Um, I'm going to start showing you single object reconstruction on ShapeNet on synthetic images, and then I will move on to um, single object reconstruction on real images on Pix3D, and then finally, the long awaited multi object reconstruction. Um, we work on ShapeNet in the same setup as uh, dozens of previous works. Um, so, here you have 13 classes. Uh, we have all the same classes for training and testing, and we have an 80 20 split. Uh, we play with two levels of photorealism. Um, low photorealism corresponds to just local lighting, uniform background, similar to many previous work. And then we try to step up to uh, higher uh, photorealism with full global illumination effects, with shadows, reflections, and environmental light, and also ground plane that uh, helps it. So here are some qualitative results for single object reconstruction. Uh, you can see the original image, the reconstruction, um, and the, the reconstruction from an overview. And this helps to see that you can actually reconstruct the hidden parts and you get fine grained details like the uh, stems of the leg uh, of the chair in this case. I prefer to, to defer to the paper for details on the quantitative analysis, but uh, the message is that we tried every combination of the contributions, of course, and uh, the rate risk connections make a good difference, about 5% of the IUU. The IU loss helps a little less, but it helps. And what surprised us is that running on high realism images works a tiny bit better than on low realism. We thought that that would be the reverse because it's a more difficult task, but uh, we hypothesized that uh, this is due to the fact that there is sh better shading and shadow cues that help you pinpoint the shape of the objects. At the time of submission, this was state of the art. In the meantime, we have been overtaken at CVPR, so we'll uh, update our camera already. Um, I was also promising you that you can reconstruct at, high, at higher resolution than the training one, so we also have an experiment in the paper on this. This is enabled to, from our new hybrid volume representation. We trained the model at 32 cube boxes and at 64 cube and tried to reconstruct at 128 cube and evaluate it at 128 cube. And the results are that um, the 64 cube model loses no performance at all and the 32 cube model loses just a couple percent. So it's actually possible to reconstruct at higher resolution than training one. We even show in the supplementary material, you can go to 256 cube as well, which is really high for a box reconstruction. You can see the effects if you're at 32 cube, you, you have this water gun, it's really all broken up. And if you upsample it with our method 228 cube, it gets much sharper, especially these fin details. We also looked at object construction in real images on Pix3D. It's a very nice data set because it's one of the few that has full 3D meshes and real images behind. So that, thank you for making it. Um, Images have multiple objects, but typically there is only one annotation. One of them is annotated with a 3D mesh. Um, so I wouldn't count this as a multi-object data set yet. Uh, we evaluate you know, by knowing which one is the target object. And I refer to the paper, but uh, um, we were better than the state of the art at, at the submission of CCV. Here are some examples. You can train the model purely synthetically or on ShapeNet Synthesis Plus uh, training data from PixCD, and that makes it better. So now I come to multiple object reconstruction on shape net assemblies. So as I said, we really wanted to have a data set where we can measure multi-view, multi-object reconstruction with perfect uh, meshes at this time. So we can look at the exact reconstruction. Um, we couldn't find a data set. So what we did, we random assembled pairs and triplets of shape net objects from 14 classes. And we trained a model specifically for pairs, one specifically for triplets, and then uh, try to uh, see if the model can reconstruct novel combinations of objects with new instances at test time. And here are some qualitative results. I think these are particularly fun. Um, I'm going to close up on one of these examples. So here you have an input image with multiple objects, and one of them particularly heavily occluded, the mug. And 
well, what this shows is that it's able to reconstruct the model, the, the, the object models from the same viewpoint and from a new viewpoint. And in the new viewpoint, you can see that the missing handle has been reconstructed nicely, is not disconnected. Those are the missing part of the ball. And all the objects are in a single common coordinate frame. The occlusions are detected and resolved. So at least in this admittedly rather simplistic multi-object setting, you must say, at least there we managed to do something. And here are other examples that shows even when the target object is heavily occluded, like the car, you can still reconstruct it well. This is uh, almost magic, but in fact, this is due to the force of recognition that's inside the neural network. After a while, if it trains a lot, it can hallucinate the whole shape just by recognizing that this is a car. Sometimes if the objects are very thin and very close, like here you get holes, like on this chair. But uh, by in general, in these um, rather artificial settings, we managed to get a good job. Um, here is a lot of data in the paper, but uh, if we look at a quantitative analysis, the big summary is that the ray trace skip connections I was telling you about before, they help a lot in the multi-object case. And this was really cheering for us because we really thought that this is what the model needed to transport more information about object boundaries, up to a 10% IU improvement. Um, the overall results drop by a good amount, about 10% between the single object case and the multi-object case. But when we analyzed this in more detail, we found out that it was mostly due to a recognition part. So if we only look at the shapes in the global IOU, they're almost as good. But sometimes the model uh, is confused between related object class like couch and, and chair. So this brings me to the end of part one, where I proposed you a rather simple model for joint reconstruction multiple objects from an image. Some components are useful for the single object case as well, like the hybrid volume representation, the ray trace skip connections. And we have a full evaluation with multiple objects with meshes. In terms of downsides, I doubt this will ever scale to dozens of objects in the same image. That's feels a little bit complex for a single monolithic model. And we have to still evaluate if it can generalize to a same combination of classes. So now we have new cars, new, new instances, but not new classes between training and test. So, um, so Shelly, I guess I pass to the second part and I take questions at the end, right? Yeah, if you, as you prefer. Yeah, let's do that. So um, now I get you to something about single object, but made with a novel type of model called the generative flow. So normalizing flow models, they quite recent, they're not due to us. And they have very nice properties compared to the famous variational autoencoders, GANs, and uh, autoregressive models that are uh, common in the deep learning era. First of all, they allow exact latent variable inference. So you can get Z given X, Exactly, and log like to evaluation, so you can do P of X on your data point perfectly. Um, and because of this, you can train directly for max likelihood instead of going for surrogate objectives like in other models. So there are also objectives. You can actually go from X to Z and back with no loss of quality, assuming your latent space is the same dimension as X. And it allows allow to do efficient inference and sampling new points compared to autoregressive models are much more efficient. So I'm going to also show you they have a compact and well-behaved latent space for downstream tasks. So I don't know if everybody encountered normalizing flow. So I made an attempt to tell it in two slides, but let's see how, how I manage. So here is the right part, the right hand side of a normalizing flow model going from the latent space Z to uh, the data points X. So decoder if you wish. Um, so normalizing flow models consist of a series of invertible transformations, typically affine, uh, that transform the initial prior on Z into the data point. The parameters of these uh, fine transformations are predicted by a neural network that operates on the, on the initial uh, data. So the overall composition can be quite complex, much more complex than a single affine. And uh, because of uh, the way the model decomposes, you can leverage the change of variable theorem to evaluate the exact log like of a sum. So normally, at least so far, as far as we know, <laughs> normalizing flow models have been used only to model the distribution of the data. P of X. And what we do here new is to introduce a new conditional mechanism that allows you to model in conditional distribution like P of XB condition on XA. So if um, XB is a point cloud, say, and XA is an image, sampling from this condition distribution basically performs the reconstruction. So how does this work? This is quite technical, so I'm just going to give an overview. So the standard uh, normalizing flow model, you can build one of them for the image like done in the past with a latent space ZA. And, and this is a sequence of, this normalizing flow model essentially is a sequence of 
of fine transformations GI, um, but the coefficients of these transformations are regressed by a neural network that operates on the data. And each one of these fine transformations is normally called a coupling layer. And uh, the reason why you can make them invertible is that you can take half of the vector, uh, copy it over, and then generate per component scale and translation parameters that a neural network produces based on this first half and copies it over on the, uh, and, and transforms it to the second half. If of every layer you swap the two, the two parts, you get, uh, as demonstrated by, by Dean in the famous real uh, VMP paper, uh, you can demonstrate that you can exploit then the change of variable theorem and get simple Jacobians that allow you to do this inverting. And now what we did new, so so far was older work, what we did new is that we built a second tower for the variable xb and this is a special kind of model. This time the affine coefficients of the affine transformations f depend not only on xb but also on xa because as input to this coupling layer we also take the corresponding input to the g transformation at the same layer in the xa tower. So in this manner, xb depends both on zb and on za, and therefore also on xa. And this implements this coupling mechanism that implements the conditioning model. So how do you do sampling in this model? Well, you can just run the model inference between xa to get on the xa tower as usual to get ca. Now you store the A, this encodes, encodes a condition on XA. Now you can sample ZB from a uniform Gaussian, like usual. And then now you can go backward and run the model in reverse, run all the inverse mappings F minus one up until XP. And you can do this because all the necessary inputs you needed for those uh, shared coupling layers, they are already stored when you did the inference pass on the XA tower, so these horizontal arrows. So the important point here is that at the end, XA depends only on ZA, but XB depends both on ZB and, Z, and ZA. So because of the structure of this conditional model, at training time, we minimize the following loss. So basically the standard log, log, log likelihood on XA and a conditional log likelihood on XB condition on XA. And then optionally, you can also um, add an invertible cycle, class cycle consistency loss that makes things better, but I'm not gonna spend time in this talk. So uh, everything I told you now works if you have very nice, um, well-behaved vector spaces as input. Unfortunately, 3D point clouds don't fall in that category because they are unordered. So we have a bunch of tricks in the paper to be able to handle 3D point clouds. Basically, first we order the points with uh, the 3D Helbert curve algorithm, which establishes a total ordering among the points, which is relatively stable across instances, but it does not preserve locality all the time. It could be that some points are um, near uh, in 3D, but they are not near on the curve. And so for this, we I don't want to explain it in detail, but for this, we actually generalize the point net approach to, to make global uh, features out of a point cloud by making it approximate, but invertible. So it's no longer an exact global feature, but it's approximate. But because it's invertible, we can use it in some normalizing flow. So this brings me to and some results. Um, so first of all, uh, as people like to show when they do generative models, we get a well-behaved Latin space. How can we justify this? So first of all, we can take um, a point XA, pass it through inference, get a latent variable Z, and now we can start handicapping Z, removing components, and then passing through the decoder part to see if we reconstruct the right shape. And I have quantitative evaluation for this in the paper. Um, here's some qualitative. And down to about 25%, 12% of the components, you still get a good shape. Um, you can also substitute the pieces that you are removing from the vector with uh, uniform Gaussian samples, and the decoder will hallucinate them and generate another version of the points that you sampled before. So you can actually get more resolution than what you trained the model for. You can produce more and more points by removing the lower frequency components sorry, the higher frequency components of the vector, which are typically on the right-hand side of the encoding. And like people always do with variational encoders, you can take two shapes, pass them into the encoding, get two Z values, and then draw a line in encoder space, in latent space, and then decode every point on the line. And this gives you an interpolation of these shapes, and it works nicely. So you can see here between uh, these two shapes, it starts adding handles 
and here between this toilet type of shape and this chair, he makes it narrower. So the main thing I wanted to do was 3D reconstruction. Um, the person that did this work also wanted to do lots of other stuff and I'll show you later. Uh, here, if you want to go from an image to the DD point cloud, you can train the model for the conditional distribution P of cloud condition on image. Then when the image comes in, you can sample out the, the, this posterior and every time you sample it, it gives you a reconstruction. And here are some examples that show the, the fact that you get the stable point clouds. And again, what I like is the prior that is learned by the neural network. You can give it the back of a chair, so you have no idea how it looks from the other side. But because of the appearance prior, it manages to generate a plausible chair when you uh, reconstruct and rotate it. You can also just flip the training and say, I'm now going to feed images um, as the output, so XB and 3D point clouds as the input. So now you can model PXB condition on XA with another model. And now when you sample out of that distribution, you get renderings. They are not the most beautiful renderings, admittedly. Here we are limited to 64 square pixels. That's the best we managed to fit in our GPUs. And, but you know, they're pretty cool. And because this is a probabilistic model, every time you, res you resample it, you get a slightly different viewpoint, a slightly different texture, all, all for free. And all very uncontrollable too. <laughs> So we try to stress generality of this work. So you do have other problems that have conditional structure. For example, we train the same model with the same hyperparameter so all set, all set to 64 square type of images uh, to go from street view images, uh, street view segmentations to street view images, or vice versa here, or to go from uh, some segmentations of facades to build to the facade images or vice versa, or from geo maps to pictures and from edge maps of shoes to shoes. This is common in a generative model works like GANs these days. Um, it's fun to see that if the domain is one-to-one, -one, like from an image that is relatively just one reconstruction, uh, one segmentation, then when you sample the model, you get almost the same thing all the time. But some domains have a high variation. Like there are many possible images that lead to the same segmentation map. So when you sample that one, every time it gives you a different CT. It's kind of pretty, in my opinion. It's captured by this. So this brings me to the end of part two. I showed you a conditional scheme for flow-based models uh, that enables us, instead of just modeling the probability of the data alone, but mod model also conditional distributions. Um, I showed you uh, quickly, most in the paper, a strategy for handling an order of 3D point clouds in such architectures. Um, we think we're the first to work to show mappings between a large diversity of domains with normalizing flows. And in the paper, we also show contest style editing and style transfer with normalizing flows. The main disadvantage is that it's really heavy to train. Um, it's heavy, especially because you need to store all these flows of every layer and back and forth. Um, so in practice, we only managed to get this to work until 64 square resolution. So it's not as impressive as, let's say, style gun. That really looks uh, very high and fine. Hopefully, this is the first time you know somebody does it when normalizing flows. Hopefully, in the future, more efficient schemes will be proposed. So I get to the last part of my talk, and I'm well on time. Um, this is uh, the lightest technically part, so hopefully uh, we still have some brain power left. This is about trying to learn an accurate and controllable rendering tool that can do this sort of stuff in a neural network. So normally, when you want to render a scene and you come from computer graphics, uh, you input some voxel geometry or some mesh geometry. Uh, you specify the materials of this geometry, like what texture it has, and the light position, maybe other parameters. You pass it into Blender, and you get a fantastic scene. So now we would like to try to replace Blender with a neural network and try to have control over appearance, viewpoint, and illumination, so that without retraining the network, the user can change its input, and you get a nice rendered image out that behaves like Blender. And you will say, why would you ever do that? Well, one answer is because if you likes it, so it gets published. But another answer is that um, you can then use it to do image editing without having the full 3D model, as I'm going to show later. And it can be used in the wider context of learning an end-to-end -end 3D reconstruction system, because once you have the neural learn network, it's fully differentiable, as opposed to Blender, which you know, not like you can differentiate through shadowing and global illumination uh, processes. So hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to use this technology in an end-to-end trainable um, 3D reconstruction pipeline. So here is an overview. 
Um, the scene is made just of one object and the ground. And you can pass it through this voxel renderer and alter any elements of the scene and the narrow voxel renderer should respond with an accurate, accurate rendered image. So the user can change the 3D rotation, translation, and scaling. It can change the light position. And it can paint the object, like changes general hue and color, or um, add a more fine-grained texture, like the text CVPR here that reviewers always like. You can also paint the floor, and hopefully the, the network responds by rendering uh, the accurate image. So narrow rendering is relatively young, but there starts to be quite some works in there. Uh, we belong to the left column of my uh, trichotomy here. Um, works that input a geometry and output a rendered image, like RenderNet, for example. So compared to, to those works, we are able to uh, synthesize finer grain textures and we're able to control other factors than just uh, the position, also the illumination and the, the composition of the texture and its life. So recently, there have been very, very high quality works on what I would call new view synthesis, works like NERF and Deep Voxels, where you provide multiple calibrated camera views of the same object or scene. You learn some implicit representation that makes it all in one, and then you are able to, to change the camera position and render a new view of that scene. So compared to, to, to these works, we, we don't need to train a separate model for every scene. We have a single model per category. But more importantly, we are able to control um, also illumination and the texturing of the object and not just the viewpoint. Then there is also a lot of works on image to image translation, uh, some of which can be interpreted as neural rendering, like uh, this paper, Neural Rendering in the Wild, where they took uh, um, point clouds, projections, and, and, and depth maps, and they managed to re-render that picture so that it would look better than just a splattered point cloud. Those are also very interesting, not totally identical to our work, but I recommend those two. Um, so here is our training setup. The uh, training time, we have uh, object geometry, a texture, and a lighting position. These are all editable parameters, a training and test time. And then we also have some fixed parameters. The light is always an ambient light. The ground is always planar. Uh, the object is always diffuse. The ground is always slightly specular. Uh, there's always an area light. Then we feed all of this in to, to Blender, and we get training data. So the objective would be to be able to do this with the neural network. So in order to make the geometry configuration editable, we work in object coordinates, and we let the user change the camera elevation, uh, pitch, and yaw, and also place an arbitrary light source changing its position and intensity, but not color, in the world coordinates. So in order to edit the materials that are made of the object, we represent uh, this to the level of one RGB value for every voxel. The easiest thing you can do to write one RGB value per voxel would be to paint them by hand. That is not as dumb as it looks. If you have a flat fill tool, you can paint every um, object part. But if you want to go for fine grain textures, you wouldn't do it by hand. So here we also propose a way to do appearance capture, where you can uh, provide an aligned image that's aligned to that 3D model, only one image. And uh, then the model captures the texture out of this. Uh, our neural network captures the texture out of this. Um, in the top case, remember, although you provide colors, the network still needs to be able to simulate shading, shadow, and all those effects. And in the bottom case, you didn't provide the colors of the hidden surfaces, so the model still has to work hard to figure that part out. So here we get to, to the model or a sketch of it. The first version, the neural voxel renderer, as we call it. Um, the input are these colored voxels. We pass them through a 3D encoder that uh, um, it goes and maintains the original resolution and uh, assembles more and more contextually uh, information on the voxel. Then we reshape it so that it becomes like an image with width height and the depth and channel dimension concatenated, stuck together. And we process this further with 2D convolutions. And at this point, you get some proto image of the object. This, this, this operation here acts like a very simple orthographic projection that prepares the network for the real rendering that happens here. Then we also process the light with a separate component of the neural network. The light position is just x, y, z and intensity. And we process it through two fully connected layers and then replicate it like smearing it over um, um, a convolution response map that has the same resolution as the um, colored voxel uh, map. And so this way, at every point in the output image, the network has a way to see where the light source would have been. So now you can concatenate these two and pass them through a 2D decoder that produces the final output to the image. And this 2D decoder has a chance to learn 
how to use the interaction between the, soft, the surface orientation of the voxels and the incoming light direction. So this is uh, early results. We were pretty happy because it could predict the overall color and the scene structure and even make shadows. But if you had high frequency texture, it washed it out completely. This is probably because of all this um, massaging of the voxel colors in this part. So this leads us to our full model, which we call Neural Voxel Renderer Plus, where we have another channel, where we another path, where we take the colored voxel and splat them down to an image. Splatting is really just plain direct projection without shadow shading, nothing. But it preserves the texture details. So now you can pass them through a series of 2D convolutional layers that don't lose resolution, they stay there. And now we can take this splatting network and concatenate its output to the output of the previous NVR image and use a upsampling network like a UNET to combine the two and produce an output image. And now you benefit from the fact that the initial network already reasoned across global illumination effects like shadows and the reflection and bounces of light and get a coarse global correct image, but you also digest the finer texture information in this platinum network. Then together they get combined into this. So to train either network, you just use image, voxel and image pairs that you rendered in, in Blender. So here are some experiments. We um, show you experiments mainly on chairs and cars. In the slides, only chairs. In the paper, cars as well. Um, we train uh, models that are specific to a category, but not to an object. So at test time, you can have a new instance of that category um, that you pass, and you just do inference. So it's nice because the network learns to do um, uh, shading. So it changes the shading of an object depending on the position of the light and the surface orientation. The shadows move accordingly. It also learns to do uh, some amount of global illumination, so secondary lighting effects like reflections on the ground. Um, if you have a complex object with thin parts, it also learns to do thin shadows. And perhaps most surprising, it learns to do multiple bounces of light, like um, the color, the intensity of um, the, the floor is influenced by the, 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 the color of the object and vice versa. So if you have a single uniform color per object that the user specifies, the network still needs to work to produce the correct shading, and it does. But perhaps more interestingly for us, and what really is kind of sets us apart from previous work, is that we are able to do highly textured objects. And here you can see that you provide one input view with the texture in one viewpoint, and then you can predict all other views. Um, and also, you have specular effects of the light bouncing off specular surfaces, which is nice. You get the shadows right. And you can play instantly with any orientation, location, and light position without retraining the model. It's really real-time output. We also have in the paper a series of comparisons with various alternatives. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but we have a quantitative and qualitative analysis versus other ways with which you could do this job. Um, the model tolerates variable resolution. You can um, um, train it at 100 voxel cubes and then still feed only at 25 cube, and the model uh, still produces reasonable uh, hallucinations of the texture that you provided at lower resolution. As I was promising, you can edit not just the light and the geometry of the object in a camera pose, but you can also edit the appearance. What does it mean? You can take your original capture view that I was mentioning, this one view where you have it aligned with the 3D model, and then you can edit it in the view. Just in the image, you can start painting. Here, the author of, main author of this paper, Constantino Rematas, painted himself on the back of this chair. Who knows where ego goes? And in the end, the model can predict new views and, and, and camera uh, viewpoints and also illumination uh, changes for these newly textured objects. We also have some brief experiments on instead of having a fixed area light, which is basically just a blurred uh, point light, we also can work with a natural illumination in the form of an environmental map. Instead of just a x, y, v, y vector, you can provide a 32 square environmental map, and this produces nice soft shadows that look a bit more natural. And finally, um, you can also do appearance capture from Pix3D, great data set, keeps helping, um, because there people took the care of aligning carefully the 3D models to the underlying real 2D images. So now we can take the appearance texture out of the 2D image and then re-render it into novel viewpoints and lighting positions uh, the right away with this method. And all, all of these 
uh, models that does this was trained only on synthetic data, not on real images. So it's kind of fun that it works, then also on real images. This brings me to the end of the talk. Um, in the third part, I showed you a narrow voxel renderer, which as, as main highlight is you are able to control object appearance and geometry and scene illumination effects. It properly deals with high frequency complex textures and it has implicit learnable interactions between uh, reflections and shadows. So far, as a limitation, it works only with one object and ground. We haven't tried it with more complex scenes. Thank you for your attention. I will take questions. Thanks a lot, Rita, uh, for, for the amazing talk. Um, do the people have any questions? Maybe I stop share and click on the Zoom so I can see the faces. So I have a question about the, the flow model, actually. Um, so you, you were showing some changes on the voxel to image on basically how the latent code changes the texture and also the, the 3D orientation. I'm wondering if the ZV vector uh, has components that are constant across different XA. So if you put different images, different voxels of a chair uh, with the same ZV, does the rotation keep constant or like illumination or something like this? I see, wow. Uh, it would be cool to have learned these entangled representations. Yes, that's a hot topic. I cannot uh, tell that. Like in practice, we did not observe these effects. The Z vector is quite entangled. <laughs> it would have been fun if it weren't. Um, and it meshes together a lot of stuff. You see, the last part of the talk, I mean, I guess you point to this one where we were doing neural rendering with the, with the normalizing flow model. That one is all one monolithic piece, right? In the last part of the talk, it's constructively disentangled and you can control parts. Um, we didn't really do it in great detail. We were already surprised it worked at all. But I, from our early experiments, it's not disentangled in the way you imagine. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I have a question regarding the um, first part of the presentation uh, when you mentioned it using the IOU for loss function. Um, so I just have help regard, with regard to um, the sparseness of the objects in the boxes or to the boxes that you mentioned. I apologize, but I don't hear you very well, Sajjad. So I'm um, just asking- um, about the IOU, but the sound is not correct. Yeah, so I, I might have missed some point there. Uh, I just wanted to make sure um, how did the IOU help using IOU for uh, as loss? Um, Oh well, yeah, I, yeah. You didn't lose a lot. I on purpose skimmed over it because you know I wanted to talk about other aspects. So it helped a little bit compared to the cross entropy loss. It helped quite a bit. About in the single object case, about four percent, maybe three percent or so in the multi object case. But compared to the focal loss, it's only about two percent because focal loss already compensates partially for the main thing that the IU does, which is take care of the most grid points are void problem. Um, in general, in our work, we also observe qualitative effects. If you do the IU loss, it learns a bit better to generate non-intersecting bodies. You know, I was saying that we want exclusion constraints. Part of this, we got them because we have a kind of multinomial distribution at every grid point over classes, so it's already by construction exclusive. But with the IU loss, it learns it better. It learns compact shapes that come out like in one, that they don't spill out in probability like, otherwise it tends to make things like, you know, I don't know, chair, 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 and the next box is half chair. So with the IU loss, it likes to be tight. We observe that. Thank you. I have a question on that uh, like work as well. Do you have a sense for like how well it generalizes to like unseen objects or if it can? I guess like if that makes sense. Or like say you see like different instances of like the mug. Um, like does it generalize well to different like shapes of the same object? Like, because I saw the, the car hallucination, right? Like, it, it could figure out, like, the prior, or, like, figure yeah. out what the car shape is. Yeah. Now, this is fine. Finally, I have a positive answer. So, um, yes, absolutely. All the experiments you have seen, they were done in the setting where all the test shapes are not seen at training time. So, they are all generalizations. Like, uh, same class? All different. of the same classes, though. So, on that part of the work, he had seen about mugs. He already saw other mugs. He saw them occluded. So he learned about 
What happens when a handle is occluded? You learn that you should fill in the gap. But all the results I've shown you, they are new marks. And so a, a next level would be to go to new classes, right? See how well that works. We did try a big qualitative, but I don't have a proper quantitative evaluation on these. And do, do you also imagine that the same architecture for the first like paper you presented would work on the scene level? You mean like, more than three objects, you mean? Uh, like not just objects, but like the structure of the scene? Like say, say you tried to apply like the same architecture to just like doing a 3D reconstruction for like the scene so as opposed to foreground objects. The difference, the difference between a cluster of objects and a scene, you mean also the walls in a room and getting the, the camera parameters and or like, yeah. like in, in your scene understanding. Well, I could well imagine that background surfaces like a table on which you might lies would be quite, would work. On the other hand, it feels a little bit overkill. Like, you know, this model is high resolution, like, you know, 256 cubes with a voxel grid is quite serious. Um, and it's trying to get all these fine grain curvatures. Um, you know, at the moment you assumed, you know, do you have a ground plane and that's it. Now, if you had a scene which is composed, let's say of core support structures and a lot of smaller objects on it, I wouldn't do it with this model. Like it feels, I mean, it yeah. could work, yeah, it could. But then maybe you would need 1,024 cube voxels, and many of them will be wasted in getting this ground plane right or this shelving. So I think there are lessons to be learned from the first part of my talk that could be useful in, in other scenarios. For example, how to get uh, super resolution, how to propagate information with ray trace skip connections. But really, a full scene with, let's say, 32 objects with lots of planar surfaces or you know, smooth surfaces that support them, I don't think it's per the perfect model, no. OK. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Those insights are great. Yeah. I have another question. It's not related to any part of paper in particular, but more into. Uh, so you you were mentioning when 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 working with creative learning, uh, like getting data is 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 difficult, and and generally there are like many challenges in kind of like annotating this data, and you need to interact with the scene to rotate and and annotate like parts of an object if you do segmentation and so on so you've been doing a lot of work on like making it easier for humans to to annotate data and it seems like that with 3d models and 3d data there's like new challenges i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on like what is the way into making this data annotation cheaper is it like through rendering engines or or do you need to like put agents into environments to annotate more easily or what are your thoughts yeah. what a great question it connects my two loves <laughs> you know, we could supervise last data annotation I did for 10 years and the new thing. Now, of course, yeah, I mean, let's answer the, the easy way and what many papers have been doing and, you know, us as well, you know, is to synthesize data. It's not that easy, you still need to sit there and do it, but at least then you get full knowledge out, all the hidden sides. The intermediate way is to do RGB diffusion, uh, Matterport and, and Sun RGBD, great data sets. Then you, you get real RGB, but not quite right 3D because you, you know, you don't, you typically don't have a watertight meshes, they're a bit broken. So the, what, what we are working on on the side is a kind of something in between that we hope will be helpful is try to have an efficient tool where humans can annotate video with 3D object models. And, you know, this is kind of not published, but we're working on it. So, I mean, the dream would be to have real pixels, like, because we keep saying photorealistic and stuff, but you know, people want real pixels, you know, and also perfect 3D meshes, watertight finish clothes at the right position in 3D space, like to have both. And for this, yes, I mean, with my humble perspective, what I can do is to try to annotate scenes with, with, with 3D models with clever ways to do the annotation, but maybe there are other ways I didn't think of, but definitely that's the future, the future in the sense of if we are as community, we want to really go you know, total 3D understanding like that paper that I like so much, really in the wild, like this beach scenes, not just indoors, anything, we'll need a lot of data. And at the moment, yeah, as I said, all the existing solutions have some, some corners. Synthetic data doesn't give you every model, only models which you have, you know, and GBD has its own holes. So yeah, we'll see what the future reserves, but I am pretty sure where there is a need, the community will respond somehow. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, I don't know if there's no more time for questions, but uh, feel free to, to send a little to people and people will discuss.